How's it going today, ladies and gentlemen? Um, so before I start the video today, I just wanted to give you guys a warning. If you have a history of sexual violence, video's not for you. If you have a, a comfortability towards sexual violence, this channel in general is not gonna be for you. Um, however, like not every video is gonna be about sexual violence, you know, but however, most of what I'm gonna be talking about are serial killers and most serial killers by psychology and by nature are usually sexual deviants, unfortunately. So, yeah, anyway, um, I also wanted to apologize for the stuttering. I got uncomfortable reading the video today. Um, and just, it was kind of hard to wrap my head around on how someone was able to just kind of chalantly record as they raped and tortured someone and then just kind of sit there in a courtroom and kind of go, yeah, if you listen to it, by the way, you'll like, there's a portion of this where, you know, like she just screams and screams and screams. It was like if he was talking about like if he was going for lunch with his buddy like it was it was ridiculous um i read this thing more than i care to read it and i had to listen to this transcript more than i care to listen to it um so yeah anyway hope you like the video and uh also hear the warning as well please um i'm not kidding i'm not trying to be dramatic this is a little messed up there are sound effects so if it does get a little intense i suggest you click off the video and just watch something else because you're in for a treat so the toolbox killers gained their notoriety by recording one of their murders that of shirley lynette ledford this tape to this day is still used to train FBI agents and other police organizations on the horrors and the things that just exist in this world. This is the Toolbox Killers. Did you at any time ever use an ice pick? No, sir. You struck Miss Lamp with a sledgehammer. Do you recall the sledgehammer which was introduced? Yes, sir, I recall it. Was that true? No, sir. Lawrence Bittaker, with an IQ of 138, dragged high school girls into his van, then murdered them by twisting a coat hanger around their throat with a pair of pliers. When his tape recording of one murder was played in court, people rushed outside and vomited. They touched Miss Ledford on the breast with cold metal pliers if you listen to the tape, you'll hear those tire pliers being replaced in the toolbox a few seconds later. Oh, what, what did you touch her on the breast for with a pair of pliers? To shock her with a cold metal. Lawrence was an unwanted child of a couple had chosen to not have children. Lawrence was placed in an orphanage by his natural mother and was adopted by Mr. and Mrs. Bittaker as an infant. Bittaker's adopted father worked in the aviation industry, which required the family to frequently move around the United States throughout his childhood. Bittaker was arrested for shoplifting at the age of 12 and obtained a minor criminal record for over the next four years after further arrest for the same offense, which brought him to the attention of juvenile authorities. Bittaker would later claim these numerous theft-related offenses committed throughout his adolescence had been attempts to compensate for the lack of love he received from his parents. Although reported to have an IQ of 138, Bittaker considered school to be a tedious experience and dropped out of high school in 1957. By this stage in his adolescence, he and his parents were living in California. Within a year of dropping out, he had been arrested for car theft, a hit and run, and evading arrest. For these offenses, he was imprisoned at the California Youth Authority, where he remained until he was 18 years old. Upon release, Bittaker discovered his adoptive parents had disowned him and relocated to another state. He would never see his adoptive parents again. Norris was conceived out of wedlock. His parents had married to avoid the social stigma surrounding illegitimate birth at the time. Norris's extended family lived in within a short distance of his parents' home due to his grandfather's real estate investments. His father worked in a scrapyard and his mother was a drug-addicted housewife. He occasionally lived with his parents throughout his childhood and adolescence, but was repeatedly placed in the care of foster families throughout the state of Colorado. 
Norris's childhood recollections were intersped with memories of wrongful accusations while living with his biological parents and being neglected by many of the foster families he'd lived with, frequently being denied sufficient food or clothing. He also claimed to be sexually abused when in the care of a Hispanic family, later stating the prejudice he held towards Hispanic people originated from the neglect and abuse he endured as a child when placed in the care of this family. Living with his birth parents at the age of 16, Norris visited the home of a female relative who was in her early 20s and began speaking to her in a sexually suggestive manner. She ordered him to leave her house and inform Norris, his father, who threatened to subject him to a beating. Norris subsequently stole his father's car and drove into the Rocky Mountains, where he attempted to commit suicide by injecting pure air into the artery in his arm. He was later apprehended as a runaway and returned to live with his parents. Upon his return, Norris's parents informed him that he and his younger sister were unwanted children and that they intended to divorce when both reached adolescence. A year later, Norris dropped out of school and joined the United States Navy. He was stationed in San Diego in 1965 and was deployed to Vietnam in 69. Although he did not see active combat during his four-month tour of duty, he was honorably discharged from the Navy after one tour of duty. According to Norris, Spitaker saved him from being attacked by fellow inmates on at least two different occasions. By 1978, the pair had become close acquaintances, discovering they had shared common interests in sexual violence and misogyny. With Norris also divulging to Bideker, the biggest stimulation for him was of seeing frightened young women. Adding this was the primary reason he had amassed a lengthy record for sexual offenses. Bideker, who is not known to have committed any sexual offenses prior to this meeting of Norris, divulged to Norris that if he ever raped a woman, he would kill her so to as not to leave a witness to the crime. When alone, the pair regularly discussed plans to assault and murder teenage girls once they were freed. This shared fantasy evolved into an elaborate plan to murder one girl of each teenage year from 13 through 19. The pair vowed to become reacquainted once they were released. Three months after Bitteker was released from the California men's colony, on January 15, 1979, Norris was released from prison and moved into his mother home in Redondo Beach. He soon found employment as an electrician in Compton, California. Shortly thereafter, he received a letter from Bideker. In late February, they, they met at a hotel and rekindled their plan to kidnap and rape girls. And in order for the pair to be able to successfully adopt teenagers, Bideker decided they would need a van as opposed to a car. With financial assistance from Norris, Bideker purchased a silver 1977 GMC cargo van in February of 1979. The vehicle was windowless on the sides and had a large passenger side sliding door. According to Bideker, when viewing this sliding door, he realized he or Norris could pull up to a teenage girl real, really close and not have to open the doors all the way. Bideker and Norris would nickname this van Murder Mac. From February to June 1979, Bideker and Norris picked up over 20 female hitchhikers. The pair did not assault these girls in any manner. These were practice runs, and they were merely a way for them to develop bruises to lure girls into the van voluntarily and discover secluded locations. In late April, the pair discovered a secluded fire road located in the San Gabriel Mountains. Bideker broke the lock gate to this fire road with a crowbar and replaced the lock with one he owned. On Halloween night, 1979, at approximately 10.30, Lawrence and Roy drove into the Sun Valley where they encountered Shirley as she hitchhiked home from the job she held as a waitress. Shirley was unknown to Norris, but a familiar face to Bideker, who knew the girl well as he frequented the restaurant where she worked. Within five minutes of Shirley entering the van, Bideker had driven to a quiet side street where he slammed on the brakes of the van before throwing Shirley from the passenger seat into the rear of the van. Norris then wrestled her to the floor stripped the clothes off the terrified girl, bound her hands behind her back. Bideker then traded places with Norris, who drove as Bideker remained in the rear of the van with Shirley. Instead of driving to the San Gabriel Mountains where they usually tortured and murdered their victims, Bideker immediately turned on the tape recorder and started slapping and beating Shirley. At the beginning of the tape, the sounds one hears are Bideker slapping her. 
and towards the middle the sounds are of Bideker beating her about the chest with his fist and tormenting the screaming and pleading girl with vice grip pliers on her genitals, breast, and nipples. Towards the end, the sounds are of Norris beating her over and over more than 25 times with a hammer upon the same elbow. After he had done so, Shirley emitted painful, strange screams of agony as she wailed and wept. Nora simply asked her, What are you sniveling about? As Shirley's arms were bound behind her back, she would not even have a normal human reaction, being able to attempt to move her arms in response to the acute pain at this point without aggravating the injury. Soon after the tape ends, Bitterker pulled the over van over and joined Norris in the rear of the van. Norris then took the coat hanger, wrapped it around Shirley's neck, twisting it as tight as they could with the lock pliers until she was dead. The 16-year-old child's agony was finally over. Bideker then decided it would be interesting to drop the body off on a stranger's front lawn in order to gauge the reaction from the press. So they picked up a random yard in Hermosa Beach and left Shirley ravaged and broken body lying in the center of an ivy bed upon the lawn. The body was found by a horrified jogger early in the next morning. This is just part of the transcript of the tape these two men, quote for quote, recorded in the van with Shirley. It does not include extensive periods where all one hears are Shirley's heartbreaking screams, weeping, gasps of pain, agony, and wailing. This is the most descriptive and comprehensive version of the transcript of Shirley Lynette Ledford's murder, and possibly one of the most gruesome things I've ever read. Um, and it's just a, that, that, you know, and it makes it a little more real because this wasn't a horror movie. This was a real life incident, and it was like if they were real life monsters. So if you have any history of sexual violence, this is where I suggest you stop. So without further ado, um, this is the murder of Shirley Lynette Ledford of October 1979. The tape begins with Bideker slapping Shirley, mid-mocking her and tormenting her by constantly slapping her face. After a certain point, Shirley begins to cry profusely as she's trying to make sense of her situation. She begs Bideker to stop hitting her, saying again, No, just don't touch me. Given what Bideker next says, it is unlikely Shirley crawls into a ball and turns away from him as she leaps. He then starts slapping her again, mocking her. And then he starts beckoning her to come on over here and start sucking me off. And she goes, Suck on what? Suck on what? Bideker says. What's this? Bideker then beckons towards his, his penis. Bideker then says, yeah, I want you to suck it. And then, like if he was directing a porno, he's, he wants to Ledford to start saying, what are you doing? She goes, sucking on your dick. What are you doing? Sucking on your dick. And then he starts asking Ledford, I want you to beg me to start sucking on your dick. After a while, Bideker had forced Shirley to flate him. Repeated sounds of administered beating, intersped with loud screams, can be heard as Bideker savagely beats Shirley about the breast and to a lesser degree her head. Bideker then extracted his pliers from the toolbox. Shirley then emits several high pitched, prolonged screams and cries of agony as Bideker alternatively squeezed and twists her labia, clitoris, nipples, and breasts with the pliers. Bideker then returns the pliers to the toolbox. Banging sounds can also be heard throughout, which are believed to have been made as Shirley came into contact with the walls and in her contacts in the van, as she rather than flailed in pain. Bideker asks, is the recorder going? Norris replies, yeah. And then more screaming is coming out of Ledford at this point. He's basically telling her to scream and scream and scream. And he's just basically, you know, saying, I want you to continue just doing these things to me. And then a sharp, shrill scream followed by wailing sounds follows. It is believed to be at this point when Bideker, having already sodomized Shirley, 
inserted the pliers into her rectum and twisted them, tearing and splitting the lining inside of her rectum. Banging sounds can be heard again as Shirley came into contact with the walls and the inner contents of the van as she again rather than flail in pain, screaming and screaming and screaming and just no one was there to help her. At this point, Norris came from the front of the van in the driver's seat and tried to place with the Bitteker as Shirley lay crying and moaning in the back of the van. Three of the four victims previously killed had all been vaginally raped by Norris, but as Bitteker had viciously torn Shirley's genitals and wrecked him with his pliers, causing her to bleed, Norris did not vaginally or anally rape her. Instead, Norris forced the already agonized girls to flayed him and switch on the tape recorder himself. More screaming can be heard from Ledford. And then unintelligible sounds are heard intersped with sounds of Shirley Ledford crying and moaning. Sounds of Norris extracting the sledgehammer from the toolbox can then be heard. As Shirley, seeing him do this, she begins crying and shouts, Oh no, oh no. And the screams in fear again, shouts, Oh no, before again screaming. <coughs> Norris strikes Shirley on the elbow. Shirley is struck on the 25 times succession on the left elbow by Norris, who repeatedly fractures her left elbow. Each time the hammer strikes her, a piercing scream can be heard. At one point, she may have tried to say something, but her voice had become an unintelligible mass of pain. Once they were finished, the tape recorder is then switched off before Norris strangles Shirley by twisting a wire coat hanger around her neck. The last word Shirley Lynette Ledford spoke at the end of her short life was, Do it. Just kill me. Bitteker and Norris then drove to the disposal of Shirley Lynette Ledford's horrifically ravaged, battered, broken, and torn body. Her body also bore deep welt marks to the wrists and ankles, indicating just how much Shirley had withered and struggled against her restraints. In one final act of degradation, Norris splayed Shirley's naked body face upwards, with arms are stretched out and legs. She passed away at precisely at about 11.10 at night on October 31st, 1979. So, you made it. Look at you. Um, so thank you for watching today's video. Um, it, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's something, isn't it? So uh, anyway, um, hope you guys enjoyed the video and uh, leave a like, comment, and subscribe. Please, 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 please. Also, share it with your friends. Yeah. Thanks. You guys, have a good night.